Hello. Graham Greene. In the later years of his life, Graham Greene's closest male friend was Leopoldo Duran, Spanish Roman Catholic priest. Over more than 20 years, the two men would meet at, at least once a year, and each summer they would set off by car, journeying through northwest Spain and Portugal. These holidays were tremendously important to Green, inspiring his last great novel, novel uh, Monsignor Quixote. Graham Green, friend and brother, is Duran's eagerly awaited biographical account of the great English writer. It begins with their first meeting in the early 70s when, out of the blue, Green telephoned Duran, a London University student at the time, in response to his letter regarding the power and the glory. Duran was doing his PhD on the writings of Graham Greene. Besides documenting in fascinating detail the incidents and adventures that lay behind the various episodes of Monsignor Quixote, Duran's book gives the first informed account of the older Greene's Roman Catholic faith. Contrary to much opinion, Green never divorced himself completely from the church. His attitude is succinctly summarized in his words to Duran. The trouble is, I don't believe my unbelief. The blur by uh, the guard, the uh, Daily Telegraph says. A richly comic and, for the most part, adorable portrait of two characters in search of a picnic spot. <laughs> and the tablet said, a revelation of the core of Green's being, fascinating and significant, what shines through its authenticity, a gospel-like simplicity and the very spirit of charity. Well, I have been reading the book again. I have had this book for I don't know how long, uh, 20 years. And um, uh, I reread it and um, I don't know why. <laughs> but I sort of uh, look the way it looks. Um, I have made... Uh, oh, how can I... Okay, I have the first part of the book. I sort of underlined or put notes there and bits and pieces of, you know, anecdotes and things so that I can share those with you just to give you a um, sort of a taste of um, a Green's life and uh, the two men together in search of a picnic spot. Um in the introduction, I will just read you bits and bobs, okay? In the introduction, he says, This is not a book of investigation, but rather a living book. For I will only write about Graham Greene, uh, the Graham, Graham Greene I knew, and the things that we discussed between ourselves. I trust it will be a lively account. How many hours of conversation they have been over so many years. Unforgettable conversations that took place over the table of a parador. A parador is a Spanish hotel. Driving around in a car or stretched out under the trees after one of the simple picnics we so enjoyed. The first letter Graham Greene ever wrote to me was dated 30th of June, 1964. Our last lengthy telephone conversation took place on the 12th of February, 1991, six weeks before his death. Our final meeting was to be 24 hours before he departed this world. 
I was summoned by him a week before his death to administer the sacraments and to be by his side, but no one was able to reach me until the 31st of March. It was half past nine on Easter Sunday evening. On the 2nd of April, at midday, I was with him at Vevey in Switzerland in the Hôpital de la Providence. Graham died the next day at 11.40 in the morning. We were alone. From the time of our very first trip through Spain, Graham told me very seriously at one time or another that he wanted me to be by his side during his last moments. He added that he had given my telephone number and address to the people concerned and asked them to get in touch with me. I shall always regret not having been with him during the last week of his life, but I thank God that Graham Green saw me at his side during his final hours. I consider myself enormously fortunate to have been in his company. Um, he goes on, I will skip here. Yeah. Our main journey each year always took place in the summer. These travels around Spain became very important to Graham Greene in his later years. Even go so far as to say that they affected his entire life. In my case, they made an indelible mark. I once told Graham on the telephone that I was going to write an article about him, but that I would be discreet. Without a moment's hesitation, he replied, forget your discretion, write it interestingly. <laughs> Let's see. Our first meeting. It took place at the Ritz Hotel in London on the 20th of August 1973. That day I came to know in flesh and blood the man whose name and whose books had been a source of help and encouragement to me for almost 20 years. The point of departure had been the power and the glory. Without any doubt, this was one of the most significant moments in my life. Anyone who had ever made an idol of someone in his or her imagination will readily, readily understand. The only difference is that in this case, reality surpassed the imagined ideal. It happened this way. One day, I answered the telephone. A voice asked, my, may I speak to Father Leopoldo Duran? Oh, Professor Sharrock, how are you? I am not Professor Sharrock. I am Graham Green. I literally almost fell out of my chair. Professor Sharrock had been my tutor at King's College, London, and I had thought the, bo the voice to have been his. I tried to explain myself, but I was totally bewildered. Graham Green was calling to see whether it might be convenient for us to meet, whether I would care to join him for lunch or dinner. At that moment, my vocabulary was reduced to two words, yes and delighted. I spoke like some sort of robot. It was agreed that we should meet at the Ritz at noon, two days later. I lived through the intervening hours in a state of limbo, rather, rather like sleepwalker. I left for the hotel with two hours to spare, but there were roadworks between the house where I was staying and the nearest underground station, and I arrived only just in time. It was 10 minutes to 12. 
After giving my name, I asked for Graham Greene. He's waiting for you in reception. Seated in a kind of low chair with his elbow resting on the arm of the chair and his face cupped in the palm of his hand, Graham appeared to be meditating. He was dressed in a grey suit and, unusually for him, he was wearing a tie. We greeted each other with an embrace. I'm not sure why, but perhaps because neither of us knew what the appropriate form of greeting should be. For Graham was also a shy man. Along with a certain natural anxiety at meeting someone for the first time, there was the added worry of my impeccable priestly garb of a black suit and snow-white Roman collar. Graham called them bourgeois vestments. <laughs> I feel sure that when Green dressed Father Herrera in rather affected attire in Monsignor Quixote, he was trying to recreate the impression made on him at our first meeting except that Father Herrera appears a very self-confident, assured priest. That's why he was a close friend of the bishops and had been his secretary, whereas I was scared stiff. My relationship with Gray and Green was destined to be an unusual one from that first moment until his death. Within a few minutes of our meeting, each of us was fully at ease and there was a mutual understanding. All right. I remember our first dinner in Madrid. We dined, we dined wherever we could for our conversation had made us very late and I did not know many good restaurants in that part of town. The first wine served was very bad and Graham scarcely bothered to taste it. I told the waiter discreetly to bring us a better wine, the best wine they had, and he came back with a bottle of Campo Viejo. Graham tried it and mumbled in a loud whisper to me, supposing we leave it here in the nicest possible way as a present to the waiter who served us. As time went by, my knowledge of wine improved and I acquired a reasonable expertise. Graham and I were even able to dine at my house alone at, some, at our leisure. Graham said that a man who knew how to appreciate different types of wine was like a man who could distinguish one writer from another and appreciate good literature. A man who was unable to appreciate a, good, a glass of good wine gave one cause for thought. He might be unpleasant or untrustworthy. That dinner, or rather our conversation, lasted five hours. We discussed the divine and the human aspects of the church, the Vatican, bishops, priests, religious orders. Graham Greene's relationships with both the ecclesiastical and secular authorities meant that he was unusually well informed. Not long before, Graham had been given an audience with Pope Pius XII. It lasted about 20 minutes, and the Pope never asked, never asked him to sit down. He had just attended a Mass say, said by, by His Holiness. Your Holiness, said Graham, during my life I have heard two Masses that impress me more than any others. The Pope asked which these were, and Graham replied, one was the Mass Your Holiness has just celebrated. And the other, asked the Pope, one that I heard Padre Pio say. 
Graham added. The Pope frowned, kept his distance, and looked displeased. Well, you remember the problems that Padre Pio, now a saint, but the problems that he had at the time. Nevertheless, before he left, Graham Greene asked the Pope to pray for his friend, Bishop Matthews, who was seriously ill. Afterwards, he learned that his friend had received a box of chocolates which the Pope had arranged to be sent from a shop in Rome. Later, Graham told me more about the Mass celebrated by Padre Pio, whom he loved and admired. After this Mass, which made a great impression on him, he always carried a little holy picture of Padre Pio in his wallet. The Mass took place at five o'clock in the morning, for that was what the Vatican required of this saintly man. The public had been waiting at the door of the church for hours in order to be allowed to enter and set eyes on the saint. Padre Pio appeared on the altar wearing mittens to hide the marks of the stigmata of the passion. He enunciated every word of the Mass very slowly and clearly, but to Graham it seemed that it had lasted no longer than the normal half hour. Only when he left the church and looked at his watch did he realize that Padre Pio had been on the altar for between an hour and a quarter and ninety minutes. A slanderous article published in England at the time suggested that Graham had left Mass before the end because he found it too long. A friend of Graham's uh, wanted to take him to the sacristy before or after the Mass so that he could meet Padre Pio, but he refused because he was frightened of finding himself face to face with the saint. Later, Padre Pio asked Graham's friend, What became of your English friend, the one who would not dare to come and see me? Nobody had previously said a word to Padre Pio about this English friend. At dinner, Graham questioned me about my work as a priest and asked my opinion of Opus Dei. At the time, I knew very little about the inner workings of La Obra, and I know no more today. I have some close friends within Opus Dei who are truly fine people, but we never discuss the subject. Graham Greene did not care for it very much and was suspicious of its cloak of secrecy. His description of La Obra in Monsignor Quixote is reminiscent of a silver stiletto. This is what he says. It occurred to Father Quixote that such a man was almost certainly a member of Opus Dei, that club of intellectual Catholic activists whom he could not fault and yet whom he could not trust. He once said something which amused me. If you belong to Opus Dei, you would be a very dangerous individual. I burst out laughing. He was joking. In chapter two, a modest man, uh, he said, um, the book reads, I have often been asked what the characteristic, uh, what the characteristic was that I found most attractive in Graham. I would have to say that it was his modesty, both in public and in private. Throughout our journeys together, there were many instances of this, as well as his extraordinary simplicity, humility, and delicacy. 
Graham must have known the value of this modesty, but he did so with wonderful humility. He often told me not to use the word humility, but instead modesty, since the word in English has a different meaning from the Spanish. When Graham came to Madrid in July uh, 1980, on an official visit at the invitation of the mayor, Enrique Tierno Galván, a journalist at the airport asked whether he considered himself to be a great novelist. He replied, Dickens, for example, was a great novelist. I write novels, some of which are a little better than others. He was appalled that the prize second-hand book dealers were asking for one of the two novels he had refused to allow to be reprinted was as much as £1,000, while a first edition of Dickens or Trollope, writers he greatly admired, might only fetch 200 or £300. In Chapter 4, Mutual Confidences, if Gray and Green were writing this chapter, it is possible that he might start by recounting a dream he once had in which the Prince of Wales told him in confidence, I tell you this in all secrecy, I am homosexual, I don't like women. I would like to share just a few of the confidences that we shared over the course of the years. By the way, he, uh, he would dream every day, apparently, Graham Greene, and uh, he wrote his dreams down, dream, dreams down and uh, he would always tell Leopoldo, Father Leopoldo, about all of his dreams. They were really close friends. The intimacy that grew up between us made me reflect seriously upon my priesthood, though it is quite possible that our discussions, such as they were, might never have taken place had I not been a priest. My being a priest was the magic key that opened our private worlds to each other. We never used that overworn phrase, and one that is so often broken. This is secret. We took trust for granted. Graham often recounted his dreams to me. In dreams, his creative imagination seems to have had a tendency to veer into the direction of Buckingham, Buckingham Palace. When two people tell each other their dreams, truthfully, night after night, a considerable, considerable amount of trust is bound to develop. I go quite frequently to the Cistercian Monastery at Osera in Spain. One night I dreamt that I was at Osera and I had just walked into the sacristy to remove my vestments after Mass. What should be my surprise when Graham Green also came in, holding a chalice in both hands, his eyes lowered and looking pensive. He had just said mass and was also coming to remove his vestments. This dream made an, an enormous impression on me. What extraordinary mystery of human psychology had put such a dream into my brain? In my first free moment the next morning, I wrote to Graham and told him about it. He replied, You know, when I converted to Catholicism, I knew I was taking on responsibilities that would not always be easy to fulfill, but they were not quite as grave as those your dream appears to suppose. (laughs) 
We would often laugh about some of the intimate stories that were told during our conversations. As a young man, Graham had been very good looking and male and female beauty delight the devil, who is only too happy to provide charming temptations to lure the unwary. For Graham, the eyes really were the mirror of the soul. Within them you could see the truth reflected and what a person was really like. He confessed that visiting prostitutes as a young man had been bad for him. A girl with an attractive, lively expression never disappointed him subsequently. Sometimes he felt, uh, he felt attracted by a beautiful body, but if the eyes were dead, he always realized after the event what a waste of time and of money he had been. Shortly afterwards, we spoke at length about Bishop Christopher Butler, the distinguished theologian, scholar and writer. We both agreed that he was one of the, one of the best intellectual minds in the Catholic Church and that his thinking left its mark on the Second Vatican Council. His career had been similar to that of Cardinal Newman's. He had been at Oxford, he became a convert to Catholicism, then a priest and later a bishop. It may be that he was not made a cardinal because of his age. Or did he refuse it himself because he did not want to look after a London diocese? As it happened, they elected another Benedictine, Basil Hume, to be cardinal. When the heart of the matter was published, Butler wrote a defense of Green and his work. Many years later, the bishop would write an introduction to my own book, The, um, the Priesthood in the Writings of Graham Green. This learned bishop invited me to dinner and asked me to tell Graham how much he would like to meet him too. Graham arrange it as soon as he could. They dine at the Athenaeum Club in London, a dinner of two geniuses. They discuss the thorniest of problems, birth control and the church view on the subject, among other things. We agreed about everything. He's a delightful man, concluded Graham. Later, Bishop Butler wrote to me to say that he would love to have another talk with Graham. I passed this on to Graham, who said that he would love that too, but so hectic is modern life that in fact they never did manage to meet again. Cardinal Heenan also invited Graham, Graham to lunch at his residence at Westminster. The conversation was enjoyable and was mostly concerned with Malcolm Muggeridge. The cardinal was very keen on him and wrote to Rome about his possible conversion to Catholicism. Green knew Muggeridge well. It was he who had recruited him to the secret service. Graham thought he rather tended to flirt with religion. Why, for example, when he was talking about the Trappists, did he have to appear on the television screen all the time? Graham once wrote him a rather sarcastic postcard. Malcolm Muggeridge did, of course, become a Catholic. I remember that it was already quite late, but we were in no hurry and we were resting on the two beds in his room in Sintra. Graham told me about a hoax letter he had received. 
An American lady had written to him saying that she was immensely rich and that she wanted to leave her entire fortune to him. Green showed the letter to a number of people who considered it to be authentic and sincere. He wrote back to the woman saying that he had no need of the money and advising her to distribute it to charity. She had insisted on leaving it all to Graham, so in a second letter he wrote that, if she liked, she could give a third to it to Daniel Ortega, the Nicaraguan president, so that he could buy arms to defend his country against the United States. On the face of it, the letter was a hoax. Graham fully expected to see it published in the press at any moment. Reagan had been informed about it. It reassured him, at least, to know that he had not asked anything for himself. Graham made me laugh a good deal when he told me a story about a woman who was a professor at an American university. She came to see him at Antibes and invited him to America with the idea of marking his 80th birthday. Everything, including the journey, would be paid for. There would be the occasional photograph. The woman insisted on putting her hand on his shoulder. She left but not long afterwards he received a letter from her in which she offered to become his secretary, his cook, and, or anything else. <laughs> Graham need not pay her anything. His mere presence would be enough. Everyone knows that Graham Greene belonged to the Secret Service. The human factor is dedicated to his sister, Elizabeth Dennis, who cannot deny some responsibility for it. The main character in the novel is a double agent. Graham told me about those parties in London to which he used to be invited without having any idea about their true significance. He did wonder how it was possible that there were so many good things to drink when, at that time of the war, everything was rationed. They were checking him out. He had, quote, a very good head. To judge by the anecdotes he related, this secret service world must have been even more extraordinary than the world of Agatha Christie. When Graham Greene was working for MI6 in Sierra Leone, he was sent a secretary. This girl became involved in an affair with a Frenchman. Graham was warned by his senior officer that he should be aware of the danger of this situation, to which Graham responded, I am quite well aware of the matter. She is acting under my advice. (laughs) Walking through London one day, he pointed out the building, the door, the room, the window, where he and Kim Philby, Philby had worked. We spoke often about Philby. They were friends and continued to be so even after Philby's defection. He had been Green's boss. Graham and Philby went on writing letters to each other, although they were only one or two a year, until the day Graham felt obliged to stop the correspondence. A former officer in MI6, uh, C, the letter C, had died and a journalist had subsequently published some of the things that C had told him, including information about the correspondence between Graham and Philby. It's the last thing I would have expected of C, Graham told me, but he exonerated him. He was a dying man, Graham said. It's all the same, I concluded. Some journalists simply have no scruples. 
Graham agreed. He had suffered badly from such treatment himself. In every profession there are examples of people who lack honour. It must have been a great disappointment for Philby. What he looked forward to more than anything else was a letter from Graham and above all his very occasional visits. In one of his letters on the subject of the invasion of Afghanistan, Philby wrote to Graham, What may surprise you is that no one approves of it here, at least as far as I know. He also told him that the KGB was not in favour of the invasion, but they involved the army so as to discredit it. Graham did not think that Philby's letter was sincere, but a year later he had changed his mind. When The Human Factor was published, Kim Philby wrote a letter to Graham in which he said it was clear that Dr. Percival is based on someone in the British Secret Service. When Graham Greene was invited to the World Congress of Intellectuals in Moscow, Forum on Peace and Human, Peace and Human Rights, he went to see Philby. Philby said, I don't want you to ask any questions, Graham. Of course, Green replied, and they spoke in a relaxed way about matters that did, did not compromise anyone. Philby's wife told Graham it had been one of the happiest conversations of his life. On the 15th of May 1988, Graham rang me to say that Philby, Philby had died. He was greatly affected by it. The obituary notice in the Times uh, particularly upset him. Some uncouth person had written that he hoped that his agony had been a long one. Graham wanted to know who could have been so cruel when everything else written about Philby had been quite moderate. On another topic, um, at supper that night Graham told me all about a trip uh, he had just made to communist Poland, Poland. He spoke in particular about his meetings with Bolis, Bolesvat Piasecki and his celebrated peace movement. This good man tried to frame Graham, but the trick rebounded on him. At a conference he attended, there were a number of writers and political figures who tried to introduce him to a girl at a reception. He did not find her particularly attractive, but he began to be suspicious and wonder why the girl should have been offered to him. Instead, he started talking to another young woman and it was clear that they both felt attracted to one another. In all probability, they would have ended up, I think, sleeping together that night. Very suddenly, however, this girl was removed from the reception. They realized that she and Graham had become too familiar with each other much too quickly. Piasecki was alone with Graham after the gathering. We started drinking heavily, Graham told me. Eventually they decided to leave. Graham was rather unsteady on his feet as they walked towards, um, towards the car, but his companion was in an even worse state. Piasecki was driving. A few minutes later they collided with something. It might have been fatal. This was when Graham said to me, Thank God I have a good head. Let's see. More gossipy things. Okay, so the conversation turned to the subject of birth control once again. It was not one we had much to agree upon. 
disagree upon. Among other less serious subjects, Green related the following anecdote. After the Second World War, he, he and his wife went to spend a few days on the Isle of Wight. On Sunday they went to Mass. An organist was playing and a woman dressed in the worst of taste was singing horribly. When she sang her most piercing notes, the priest cringed and hunched his back and shoulders as if he were remembering bombs falling during the war. A boy of about 16 was serving at Mass and the priest whispered a message in his ear. The server approached the organist and the singer. She was furious and said in a loud voice that could be heard by all those nearby, Tell the old bugger to sing it himself. And she left. <laughs> A greater part of our conversation at dinner turned on the complete lack of tact of many confessors and the very serious blunders which can take place in the confessional. Personally, I know many cases where an angry or rude priest has managed to put, off, put people off going to confession for life. They very much liked my way of assisting those who said that, that they had not been to confession for a long time. People sometimes entered the confessional in such a nervous or frightened state that they could hardly speak. It was not a problem. I would ask, how long is it since you have been to confession? A very long time, Father. More than a hundred years? Oh, no, not as long as that, Father. Fifty? No. In that case, it's not a long time. I would say persuasively, laughing a little. The penitent would feel relieved. Wings grew on him. He was cured. How easy it is to be a marvelous confessor. I also recounted a story about the time I told the priest that he should not sit down and hear confession if he was aware that he was in a bad mood. It was by now late and we went up to bed, but Graham, Graham and I were now alone in our rooms out there in the garden. A drop of the uh, old wine helped the conversation continue for another hour. It was very late when we left each other. Around two o'clock in the morning Graham came into my room. My door was open and there was only a short distance between our two doors. I'm sorry, said Graham. I saw your light on and I thought I heard someone crying. Don't worry, Graham. I was saying my rosary. I sometimes say it aloud so that I won't fall asleep and to think I've kept you awake. Thank you for telling me, he said. Please go to sleep now. Um... On the 16th of August 1978, Graham and I were in London. I arrived at the Ritz at 1.30 p.m. Graham came down immediately. We embraced warmly as usual and went to have lunch at Stone's restaurant. He was carrying three books by Brian Moore, which he inscribed to me later at lunch. I can only give an outline of that two or three hour conversation for it would be in inappropriate to say any more. We were discussing how well the media had dealt with the death of Pope Paul VI. 
he told me that a certain character had called the Pope a silly old fool on the BBC and had been sacked from his job. Graham's voice sounded quite angry. Um, he could not bear to hear ill spoken of the church or of the hierarchy by people who were not Catholics. It was a very different matter if the criticism came from within the church. And yet, in this is instance, the person who uttered the unfortunate remark was a Catholic whose divorce had not been recognized by Rome. It appeared that Paul, uh, that Paul VI had personally looked into the case. He told me about his private audience with Paul VI. Graham felt he had been rather more intimate than the one he had had with Pius XII. The Pope had invited him to sit down and had been more straightforward. He told him that he had read Stumble Train and that he was now reading The Power and the Glory. But, Your Holiness, is you are reading a book that has been banned by the Church, Graham told him. Who banned it? Cardinal Picciardo. Oh, Cardinal Picciardo, said the Pope, shaking his head from side to side. <laughs> Another. He had been in hospital, and he says the nurse who looked after Graham was very kind. One day she said to him, my father reads many books of yours. In French, Graham asked her. This was in, in France. In French, Graham asked her. No, in English. Well, where do you come from? From a very small country which you probably don't know, of course. I come from Belize. Oh, but I am a very close friend of your Prime Minister. I was with him two years ago. The Prime Minister was called George Price. On Graham's last trip to Panama, his friend General Torrijos had asked if he would travel to the former colony of British Honduras because he wanted him to meet his friend, the Prime Minister. Graham subsequently wrote me a letter about him that was a thousand times more affectionate and admiring than he would have been if he were writing about the President of the United States. This is what he wrote. The Prime Minister, George Perez, is an extraordinary character. He had wanted to be a priest, but after two years in the seminary, his father died and he had to leave to look after his ten brothers and sisters. Now he goes to Mass and Communion every day at 5 a.m., lives alone and goes to bed between 8 and 9. Knew my books better than I do and loved talking about Teilhard and Thomas Mann. Love in haste, Graham. In chapter 6, um, Literature and the Nobel Prize, um, we carried on talking. I believe that the unconscious, play, uh, plays, the unconscious plays an important part in poetic creativity, perhaps in literary creativity in general. Although it was my intention to ask questions, I mentioned in passing the well-known idea that more unbelievable things happen in real life than they do in the most imaginative fiction. The novel is concerned with real life and extraordinary events are rare in life, said Graham. During our conversation, someone used the term realism and naturalism. What is the difference between those two words, asked Graham. I see none. Later he added, I would not use the word criticism, but rather appreciation or condemnation. Critics, he thought, very often behave like 
flies. One day at the Parador at Venavente in Spain, our faithful friend, the third man, who actually was the driver of the car, who drove the car, used the word culture. Graham, who had become a little impatient with the subject we were discussing, retorted sharply, I detest culture. Neither Shakespeare nor Cervantes nor Racine were cultivated men. Culture is the prerogative of pedantic professors. <laughs> Graham improvised this phrase in one of those flashes of brilliance. It remained embedded in my mind like a bullet. Unamuno had written something similar. Unamuno is a Spanish philosopher. A pedant is a fool who has been damaged by culture, Unamuno had said. I was also reminded of his pithy retort to Mary Reynold, the English novelist who lived in South Africa, who had once insulted Graham in a letter. I have not read any of your work, he said. If I do read any of it some day, I will do so with more care than you have read mine. On the 23rd of February 1984, Graham Greene was the principal guest at a lunch to celebrate the 10 best novels of our time. It was a promotion organized by the book Marketing Council in London, in which a number of well-known authors were asked to nominate their favorite books. Graham had a bad, a bad cough and a cold, but according to Elizabeth, he apparently made a very good and amusing speech. The ten best novels of our time is a contradiction in terms because the best can only mean one. In any case, as soon as Graham read out his list of titles, various publishers ran to the telephone in order to try to acquire the rights in the books he mentioned. It was enough for Graham to write a few lines in a preface praising a book or to recite a poem for the work to be given a new life. This happened with The Green Child by Herbert Reed and the work of the poet Arthur Hugh Clough. The names of countless authors cropped up in our conversations over the course of the years. I feel it may be useful to list some of them and to give a very brief summary of Graham's opinion of their work. On Shakespeare, Graham was not very fond of Hamlet. The contradictions which appear in the play between what the ghost says and what Hamlet says may be intended to confuse the audience or reader or may be due to Shakespeare's limited knowledge of theology. The former is the more likely. Graham prefer Othello, Antony and Cleopatra, and Troilus and Cressida. In his youth he loved Macbeth but he had learned the text by heart and believed that this had spoiled his enjoyment of the play. He did not care for the tempest. In Graham's view, it was not true to say that very little was known about Shakespeare. Much more was known about him than about many of his contemporaries, Marlowe among them. Graham preferred Webster's best plays, The White Devil and The Duchess of Malfe, to those of Shakespeare. He didn't much like Marlowe's Fastus. We often spoke about D. H. Lawrence. Graham did not consider him a great novelist, nor much of a lesser one. Women in Love was perhaps his best novel but he did consider him one of the great English masters of the short story. He also thought highly of him as a poet and considered some of his poems to have great spiritual depths. 
the rather false sexual content of his novels, which Graham attributed to his highly sexed German wife, Frida, ruined his work. Frida had apparently once offered herself to A.S. Freire, the former managing director of Heinemann, who was Graham's first publisher, as well as the publisher of Lawrence's work. Um, Graham told me that he did not much like Hemingway, apart from his short stories and The Old Man and the Sea, although he did not particularly care for that novel. He felt that For Whom the Bell Tolls lacked verisimilitude. The girl should not have been beautiful, but rather ugly and ordinary, and she should have fallen in love with a Spanish patriot rather than an American. Why did Hemingway commit suicide? Green's opinion was that he could see that his reputation as a writer could go no further. He could no longer produce ideas. His creativity had run dry, and that was intolerable. There was no substitute, not even love. Shortly before he died, Graham told me that if he were not able to go on working, it would be better to die. He had a high opinion of waiting for, for Godot, but he felt that in his other place Beckett seemed to be extolling his own lack of hope. This playwright did not interest him, and at the time we spoke he had just read a highly critical article about him. For Graham Greene, Dawn was perhaps as profound as Hopkins. Um, Let's see. Graham had very much enjoyed David Lodge's novel How Far Can You Go, which dealt humorously with birth control, but he did not understand the word of a book of criticism that Lodge had brought out. T.S. Eliot uh, was frequently the subject of our discussions. Graham told me about Eliot's friendship with uh, John Hayward, who had helped T.S. Eliot a great deal with his powerful criticism. They had flats on the same floor of the same building, and Hayward, who was paralyzed and died young, had a bell with which he, would sum he used to summon Eliot if he felt unwell during the night. When Eliot married a second time, he left the flat without saying a way to Hayward, probably so as not to upset him, but he actually succeeded in, uh, in hurting him much more. The dedication of the wasteland to Ezra Pound, although seemingly gracious, may actually have been a little derogatory. Nevertheless, it is clear that the waste land would not have been what it is without the critical help of Ezra, Ezra Pound, he said, although Graham felt that Eliot should not have allowed one of the passages to be suppressed. Graham did not understand the cantos of Ezra Pound, but he had a high regard for the early poems. He did think very highly of Eliot as a poet, naturally, but he did not rate him as highly as Yeats and Hardy. Trollope is one of the English novelists Green most admired. In his view, he was possibly a better novelist than Dickens. He very much liked his short autobiography. Oh, I have it. I have it. I loved it, yeah. He very much liked his short autobiography, although he sometimes found it a bit sentimental. He preferred the political novels The Way We Live Now and The Eustace Diamonds. Uh, he preferred those to his Barchester novels. With regard to Joyce, he preferred his collection of short stories. Dubliners and the portrait of the artist as a young man. He thought Ulysses contained many good things, but also much obscurity. 
As for Finnegan's Wake, he told me to listen to it on a record read by the author. When he mentioned Dublin, as he also recommended the short stories of J. F. Powers most highly. Graham had just reread Miguel de Unamuno's Life of Don Quixote and Sancho. Unamuno, as I said, is a Spanish uh, writer, philosopher. We discuss Unamuno's theory that Cervantes derived his inspiration from Saint Ignatius of Loyola when he had created the character of the knight, Quixote himself. What had Cervantes intended when he wrote the, his marvelous book, asked Graham. Is it not a book filled with the philosophy of life? Um, anyway, he has quite a long about... I will skip, uh, because this is, this is rather long. The question of Graham Greene and why he was not awarded the Nobel Prize is one of those subjects that was worn thin by the world's press each time he failed to obtain the prize. At the time Monsignor Quixote was published, an article entitled Graham Greene at his best on the front page of the Washington Post book World said this. They should award him the Nobel Prize for Literature. It is time. In the same paper, Jonathan Yardley, in a fiery article, Nobel and the Politics of the Left, in the, on the 25th of October 1982, protested angrily. Let us contemplate the astonishing fact that the members of the Swedish Academy, in their collective ignorance and bias, have once again refused to give the award to the writer who deserves it above all, above all others now living, Graham Greene. On Politics and Politicians Graham Greene had a vocation for politics. To parody the remark of the philosopher, nothing that took place in the world was foreign to him. Hearing the eight o'clock news in France as well as reading two or three British newspapers was a necessary ritual for him. The first time he became actively concerned with the political situation was in his support for Fidel Castro's men in the Sierra Maestra in 1956-59 when he made sure they received clothes. This was how his sporadic relationship with Fidel Castro, which we shall describe later, came about. It was on the 25th of May 1979 that he first spoke to me about some British hostages in El Salvador who were employees of Lloyd's Bank and the steps he took to free them. The guerrillas in El Salvador were grateful to Graham Greene for his modest economic support which was given through Omar Torrijos, right-hand man, Tuchu. Graham trusted him and respected his integrity. The assassination of Archbishop Romero on the altar while he was saying Mass in 1980 reminded Graham of the murder of Thomas Beckett in Canterbury Cathedral. The government of El Salvador was responsible for this, as it was no long afterwards for the murder of the Jesuit priests and their colleagues at the Universal, uh, University of Central America run by the Society of Jesus. Graham Greene's definition of a politician was awesome. Quote, a politician, he told me, is someone who is totally amoral and corrupt through and through, with the very occasional exception. 
politics for Green were a necessary evil. Somebody has to take charge of the community known as the state, the political association, which aspires to the greater good of all, as Aristotle put it. The Estagirita speaks of the metaphysical concept of the politics of ideals. Unfortunately, politics as we know them do not in fact aspire to the universal good of every citizen. They do so only in theory or in the vain words of the politician who lies to the citizen in order to gain his or her vote. Having obtained this, in the name of true politics which aspire to the common good, the politician debases himself. He creates his personal politics, something which is no longer really politics but egoism, since he has forgotten all about the common good. From this moment on, the politician thinks only of his own well-being. In his glory and with his money, he will no longer serve, but be served. This is the worldly politician defined by Graham Greene, the only kind we know with a very occasional exception. In few areas of human understanding is there is there such a flagrant gulf between the real and the ideal as in the prevailing politics of everyday life. The notion of the common good is omnipresent in Green's politics. I believe that the following anecdote which he related himself perfectly defines his own ideology towards res publica. At the time of the Spanish Civil War, Graham Greene decided to come to Spain and do something for the cause of truth. For which side, for which side should he fight? Franco was a Catholic, but Graham hated him as he hated all totalitarian systems. Neither did he care for the communist and the socialist on the other side because they committed murder and all sorts of vandalism, particularly against the church. So he decided on a third path, to fight on the side of the Basques under the command of Aguirre. On the one hand, there were Catholics, like Green. On the other hand, they had nothing to do with totalitarianism. In London, he was supplied with some impressive credential, credentials covered with seals and stamps. They were an introduction to a certain person who would meet him in Marseille. The place where he was to meet this person was worse than humble. It was miserable. Graham walked up a dimly lit staircase and there, in an untidy, rumbling garret room, was a man shaving. Graham handed him his papers, which the man read having broken the seals. He told Graham quite sharply, There is no way in which I would go back and fly over Bilbao. The other day they sent me out against Franco's planes and it's a miracle I'm still alive. No, I'm not going back there. So ended Graham Greene's intentions of, intentions of being of some use in the Spanish Civil War. <laughs> When he had finished relating this anecdote, I said with a smile, we would have to call this story a mistake on the road. His views did not alter at all from the time he published his novel It's a Battlefield in 1934. Possibly no other intellectual of his generation was so loyal to his first political principles. This is what we agreed. Democracy was preferable to dictatorship in normal circumstances. 
democracy that is that res democracy that is that respects human and personal rights democracy carried with it more disorders bank robberies and things like that but dictatorships did not respect human rights sometimes i asked graham but supposing uh, democracy brings with it continual disorder, frequent crime, etc., while right-wing dictatorships, for the most part, avoid such things. Graham insisted that a person's human rights were better maintained under a democracy, but he, not, he could not convince me, nor could I persuade him otherwise. So much for the advantages of one system over another. They are much better in theory than they are in practice. Human rights are trampled on daily, are trampled on daily in the name of human rights. Graham could be prescient too. After his trips, his trip to Russia, a few months after Gorbachev had come to power. Green was totally convinced that the saviour of Russia had arrived. He always believed that the shift in communism in Russia would come from the army or, more likely still, the KGB. For the brightest graduates, the best educated and those who had seen the world and knew foreign languages belonged to that organisation. On my visit to Antibes at Christmas 1982, we spoke of Andropov, the new Soviet leader. He came from the KGB, a cultured man, man and better educated than previous general secretaries of the party. Graham was annoyed with the absurd US policies of Reagan. It was ridiculous not to listen to a drop of proposals or at least find out whether they were sincere in any way. He grew irritated. Quote, America is a disaster in its political, ethical and the economic policies, he said. In politics, she is infantile. In ethics, totally materialistic. And in economic matters, totally selfish. At Nice Airport he returned to the subject of Andropov. If only he were clever enough to liberate Christianity. All the occupied nations were Christian. Poland was entirely Catholic. Russia herself was deeply religious. Goes on for a while there. Let's see. I have something else. A sense of humor. Anyone who has read Our Man in Havana and Monsignor Quixote must suspect Graham Greene of being an accomplished practical joker. The story about Senor Marquez in Monsignor Quixote was Graham thinking of the novelist Garcia Marquez when he wrote it, was that it? Who was able uh, to secure his? Uh, who was able to secure his marital rights in good conscience, with the simple device of a small bell and an eavesdropping butler, is among the wittiest, wittiest things he has written. So too is the idea of converting vacuum cleaners to clean the dust from Soviet atomic missiles, an outstanding feat of the imagination. Actually, so, so this is where it started, because now in the present war, um, they were saying at the beginning that they, they were getting, the Russians were getting their chips from um, refrigerators and uh, vacuum cleaners and so on so I didn't know that uh, <laughs> I have to read uh, Our Man in Havana I, I've never read that ok let's move on ok so um, 
me see. No, this is not important. Okay. Despite his sense of humor, it was always evident that Graham Greene had a very nervous disposition. He often told me that he was not a steady person and that he was unstable. Throughout his life, let me drink a, gl a glass of water here. He often told me that he was not a steady person and that he was unstable. Throughout his life, he had a way of appearing anxious and ill at ease. From the time of his psychiatric treatment at the age of 15 or 16, a period which he always reckoned to have been one of the happiest of his life, right up until the moment when he felt unable to spend two consecutive full days at the monastery at Osera, in spite of the admiration and warmth he felt for the monks and their lives of silence, there was always this restless side to him. Um, it should also be said that Graham slept badly practically all his life and had taken sleeping pills since his youth and that he could sometimes feel enormous remorse. Furthermore, he dreamed a great deal, and since he had always attached a great deal of importance to dreams ever since his psychoanal uh, psychoanalysis, he used to make notes of these dreams the moment he woke up, switching on the light to jot down a brief summary before he forgot the dream. This meant that sleep was never a great comfort to him. Because he never rested sufficiently, his nervous system was not nourished as, as it should be by the essential hours of sleep, resulting in his relatively instability and comparatively mercurial changes of mood. All these factors have to explain why Graham Greene was someone who so cherished his freedom, who hated feeling claustrophobic and loathed feeling, he, feeling that he was protected. He said to me one day on the road from Burgos to Logroño, I don't feel as if I were free. What had gone wrong? The trip in question had actually been planned by a third party because it had been necessary to make hotel reservations in advance and these had been paid for beforehand. Graham appreciated all this, but nevertheless he felt as if he were not free. He could not bear to feel that things had been programmed for him. It was not his fault. That was the way he was. He was made to rebel and protest whenever the shadow of the most trivial imposition threatened his freedom. Graham's sudden outburst could be disconcerting. His mood, cha his mood changes lacked any basis of reason and would normally occur at hotels and paradores at the end of a meal or after a late dinner. We might arrive feeling hungry and thirsty and drink at least half a bottle too much between us. It was the half bottle that would do the damage. On our picnics in the country, there was never any unpleasantness. The breeze from the trees and the murmur of the water provided balm and peace. The first time Graham truly lost his temper was on the 2nd of July 1981 in the restaurant Valencia in Salamanca. We arrived there for lunch at about three o'clock in the afternoon. The meal had begun well, with each of us convincing the other that the man standing watching us on the corner was a secret agent. 
Then we, b we began to discuss all sorts of things, among them the business of arms dealing. It was a subject we had spoken about frequently, just like anything else. But the timing was unfortunate. Two contradictory ideals suddenly came to, Graham, to Graham's mind, the priest of peace and the weapons of death. Graham made some unfortunate remarks, some of them rather insulting, about the priest and the weapons. I listened to as much as I could in silence, but he had gone too far. It was clear from the expression on my face that I took it seriously. Time and again he would ask my forgiveness uh, later. I drank one glass too many. The remorse he suffered for what had happened affected him very seriously. He took the blame so much to heart that he called me a few days after he had returned to Antibes, still very upset by what had happened. I had to talk to him very seriously in order to persuade him to forget this unimportant incident. The worst discussion for many years took place on the 16th of August, 1984, in the Parador at, at Segovia. By the way, all these details about uh, when things happened, um, he wasn't, uh, the priest wasn't doing this in order to write a book. Uh, Graham Grimm actually asked him to record his conversations. Um, and uh, later, he, when, when he died, he could publish them. If, but he insisted on him taking notes at the end of the day of the conversations they had had. It was Green's idea. In any case, the worst discussion for many years took place on the 16th of August, 1984, in the Parador at Segovia. It was after three o'clock and we were eating some delicious little lamb chops for lunch. We were exhausted. We, drink, we did not drink much wine, but perhaps the effects of gin on Graham and whiskey on the third man, the driver, may have been partly to blame. Or maybe I was just being too serious at the time. We dined at the same parador that evening and asked for more of the lamb chops that we had eaten for lunch. At dinner, the conversation grew even more inflamed. I believe it was the only really overheated conversation we ever had. The subject, the Pope's involvement in the political situation in Central and South America that is, John Paul II. Graham attacked the Pope very strongly. His meeting with Reagan on the eve of the American elections, the Pope's treatment of the priests who were members of the Nicaraguan government, the fact that he had not publicly condemned either the assassination of Archbishop Romero or the attacks on the North American nuns. I defended the Pope uh, stoutly. It was not true in my view that he had not condemned the murder of Archbishop Romero publicly. How foolish I was. Had I burst out laughing, it is likely the matter, um, uh, likely the other, the other two would have reached um, uh, reacted sim similarly, but because of some morbid scruple on my part, I got angry and I ruined everything. It had been a grim evening and we bid each other good night fairly stiffly. When I went to call on Graham the next morning, I found him looking very odd indeed. He opened his arms to me in a gesture. We drank too much last night, he said. But that's true. Don't worry. Joy, alegria. Okay. 
<coughs> his darker side. Was Graham Greene uh, depressive? He reckoned that he was, but he added that his depression had been more frequent and more serious during his youth and adolescence. He used to say that with age he got less and less gloomy. When we talked about this, Graham recalled the well-known occasion when he had fallen in love with his, sister govern his sister's governess and his subsequent suicide attempt. He decided he would be rid of, uh, of this life and so he swallowed 15, between 15 and 20 aspirins with a glass of whiskey. He fell asleep and woke up feeling more comforted and alert than ever after one of the best sleeps in his life. As luck would have it, there was a telegram waiting from an old girl friend asking him how he was. Because of the happy coincidence of that telegram arriving at that particular moment and after that sleep, Graham concluded as uh, he recounted the episode to me, I began to feel happy again. The depression had led to his three-month uh, drinking bout. Um, I'll start again. The depression that led to his three-month drinking bout had been an unfortunate start to his career, to his Oxford career. Fate came to his rescue in the shape of his tutor, who helped him resolve to be patient. Graham and I often spoke about his periods uh, of depression, especially those in the years following his adolescence. His fits of temper were sudden but always sporadic and momentary. On the other hand, it is obvious that that a psychiatrist might well have noted certain aspects of his behavior which were abnormal. There were the telepathic phenomena which he told me about himself and which were also associated with his mother and older sister. The nervous hypersensitivity that could affect him for no reason at all his fits of boredom tinged with sadness. But these were all passing afflictions. I never saw Graham Greene affected in these ways for very long. His moods were relatively mercurial. As Graham told me, and as the wife of the psychiatrist who treated him in adolescence told his bio biography, Norman Sherry, Quote, it was a pity he decided to write novels because he would have made an extraordinary medium. I am no psychiatrist, but there were certain moments during the course of our friendship which caused me considerable worry. In particular, one seriously alarmed me and suggested that Graham may have been the victim of occasional depression. <clears throat> As we walked, we we both held a small glass of wine, um, white wine, in our hands. Graham suddenly stopped, looked me in the eye, and spoke the following heartfelt words. If Reagan should be president for another four years, something which is most unlikely, I may become a communist. Being a communist is not the same thing as being a Marxist mind. This does not mean I'm giving up the faith, though. And he continued, Tomorrow I'm leaving by plane for Antibes. One never knows whether a plane will crash. Should that happen, I entrust your conscience in all seriousness, seriousness, I'm telling you, 
I entrust your conscience with these words which I would like you to make known. Should Reagan continue as president for a further four years, Graham would probably have become a communist. <laughs> On an earlier occasion, Graham had also said to me, supposing I were seriously ill and in danger of dying, I would summon you to be with me at that time. I would try to make good confession. And at the end, I would say, I entrust you with this message, which I want you to state very clearly in public. And he said the same words he had just spoken about becoming a communist. I seriously believe, Graham, Graham continued, that there is no reason why a communist should renounce his Catholic faith and that communism was one thing and Marxism was another. I stared at him, wondering whether he was being serious or speaking half in jest. But he said emphatically, I am being perfectly serious. I felt very moved when he said this. In that lonely place and in that lonely atmosphere, his words seemed to be spoken so earnestly that I needed all my strength not to show that my eyes were moistening. For God's sake, I begged him earnestly, let us change the subject. Only God knows who is going to go first, you or I. And indeed, we did change the subject, but nothing will ever erase Graham's solemn words from my memory. Even then, he continued, for God's sake, Leopoldo, broadcast it to the four winds that I died wanting to be a communist, but without wishing to abandon the Catholic faith. Graham's voice sounded totally natural and calm when he spoke. It was quite clear to me that he was not feeling depressed or even melancholy. Thank God he arrived back in Antibes safe and sound. Reagan was elected president for a second term. Graham did not become a communist, nor did he remind me of his most serious, these most serious of conversations. At the time of Graham Greene's death, Paul Gray wrote the following in Time International. Greene never took his religion lightly, and the Catholicism that would come to stamp his fiction served both as a stern gauge by which to measure the behavior of fallen mortals and as a powerful source of divine mercy. And on the same page, the magazine introduced Paul Gray's article with these words. Graham Greene invaded and shaped the public imagination more than any other serious writer of this century. These are the most accurate words I have ever read about Graham Greene. It was Graham Greene's obsessive faith and the problems it engendered that provided the basis for our friendship. Without this obsessive faith, which was constantly at war with itself, in this sense he was the English Unamuno, all right, and the fact that I was a priest, such a relationship would never have been possible. To show, to show what I mean, I have selected three occasions on which Green's faith appeared to consume his whole being and overwhelm him. During our first conversation, Graham Green put this surprising and unexpected question to me. Do you think I have true faith? Now, 
Graham knew that I had spent several years studying his work. I stared at him with a look that was part questioning, part disconcerted. After a few moments' silence, I replied, You know, as well as I do, that there is no effect without a cause. Reading your books, I notice that the name of God appears constantly. But that's not all. Your work hinges on the existence of that being. I genuinely believe that your faith, Graham, is greater than mine. I have no doubt about it. Graham Green was astonished at this reply. Thank you very much indeed. Your answer is very comforting. He was clearly delighted and moved by what I had said. He had, incidentally, already said something similar in a letter he wrote to accompany my doctoral thesis at King's College, London, which was later published in Spain. This is what he wrote. Dear Father Duran, I have read your thesis with great interest and I am glad to have your theological support. Thank you very much for spending such time and patience on my work. I have received a great deal of encouragement from your thesis. We went on talking. In the course of that first conversation, which I referred to in Chapter 1, we got along so well that we might have been old friends, and when Graham asked me quite openly about my own, my own faith, I answered truthfully and succinctly. He asked him whether he himself believed, and he said, uh, the Father Duran said, I do not believe in God, I touch him. I am absolutely convinced that this remark was providential in my whole relationship with Graham Greene. It was something that just came out, I did not think about it. I touch him every day. Yet for Graham, it remained cleave to his heart. As time passed, I began to see it was a crucial phrase for him and the only one he needed, as will become clear at the end of this chapter. The dialogues between Monsignor Quixote and Sancho have the remark at their core. <clears throat> Once he had been spoken by the Monsignor, at first, the priest uses the phrase literally. Later, he changes it somewhat. He believes he touches God. Greens wanted Monsignor Quixote to be a book about doubt, not certainty. It was to be an autobiographical book to some extent. Father Quixote tells Sancho that he too had his doubts, like any other mortal. And Sancho is rather bemused. He had sought the priest's company because he thought that in his company all doubt would be removed. In The Other Man, Green, Green immortalized that casual remark when he confessed to Marie-Francoise Salaine, Quote, I am inclined to find superstition or magic more rational than abstract religious ideas such as the Holy Trinity. I like the so-called primitive manifestations of the faith. What are they? asks Miss Elaine. And Green replies, Oh, the ones I've been telling you about and others which are harder to describe. For instance, one comes across people endowed with a strange aura. I'm thinking of a friend of mine, Father Duran. The French words Le Père Duran were omitted in the English translation. <coughs> 
Father Duran, a Spanish priest with whom I go traveling every year. He has a faculty for bringing people to life. He is not a conventionally pious man, but he is possessed by an absolute faith. When I asked him to describe it, he modestly replied, I do not believe in God, I touch him. What follows took place in Antibes on 16th December 1982. We were discussing Graham's faith and some of the difficulties he encountered. He can quite readily accept heaven as a purely active state and purgatory as well, but hell is not the same. How can one reconcile eternal damnation with the infinite mercy of God, who is our Father? Graham argues his case rationally. With the help of faith, he can believe in hell, but his reason rebels against this truth. We discussed these problems slowly. God is not only merciful, I added, quoting St. Thomas Aquinas. Furthermore, his infinite mercy can supersede his infinite justice. I try to say something of these tremendous, fathomless mysteries about which our human reason can only stammer and stutter. Later, I spoke of the joy and simplicity of my own total faith. Graham replied more or less as follows. When you speak of faith, I feel reassured and happy. Our visits to one another are my peace, and they mean everything to me. I can only say that this was not Graham's normal style of re response, for he was usually so restrained, considered and profound. Nevertheless, I feel sure that even if these words are not his literal words, they give the exact sense of what he said. Providentially, the steadfastness of my own faith was the overriding argument. He was delighted that I should talk about my faith. He was happy to see me happy. My self-assurance made him feel at peace. He who always seemed to live in a state of war in his own hidden world. It is quite obvious that Graham never saw anything unusually spiritual about me. I simply said my daily mass the absolute basic essential for a priest who has faith, and tried my best to say the rosary. I did try to pray in the back of the car after each of our midday picnics, but I usually fell asleep. How Graham laughed when he saw me asleep with my rosary in my fingers. Whenever the engine started up, he never failed to say, Time for your rosary. <laughs> and when he noticed that I had woken up, he would ask me, trying not to laugh, Have you finished your rosary yet? I did laugh. We understood each other well. He probably took pleasure in remembering the word of Jesus. The words of Jesus. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. It was 8th of July 1987 and we were in Vigo. I wrote in my diary, after breakfast we remained chatting at table for over an hour at far-reaching discussions, a far-reaching discussions about his faith. Each day I have less and less faith, said Graham. And I replied, yes. But you have often told me that with every passing day you find you have less belief, but more faith. Graham was silent. He suddenly came out with the most perfect remark on this subject. The trouble is, 
I don't believe my unbelief. No more precise sentence could have been uttered to define the faith of this man to describe his spiritual life. When I heard him made this remark, which I later described as his life's formula, I asked him, do you mind writing down, writing down that wonderful phrase for me? He replied, best not to write it down. It's a private remark between ourselves. The phrase is beautiful, both from a literary and a theological standpoint. Like some precious, tiny jewel, it sums up and contains, in essence, all there is to know about the embattled faith of this man whose simplicity was so like that of a child. I have much more, but perhaps I should leave it there because this has probably gone on for well over an hour. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, until next time.